is on all of them. Like the finger of God. <laughs> May I ask, Inspector, why we've all come here? It is just as well to see a good man or two. <laughs> Sensations that you are all mad. <laughs> God forbid that madness should in any way interrupt friendship. Come, gentlemen, let us go round to the garage. Peabody buildings, and that I shall soon wake with a jump. <laughs> or if that's not it, I think I'm sitting in a small cushion cell in Anwell, <laughs> and that the doctor can't make much of my case. <laughs> You've gone mad! I might be mad, but humanity isn't! <laughs> you are a decent fellow. You can believe in a sanity that's not really your own. And you're right about humanity, but you're not right about Ducroix. I suspected him from the beginning. He's rationalistic. And what's worse, he's rich. When duty and religion are really destroyed, it will be by the rich. They're really destroyed now. The devils are coming on. I say we try and bang through the thick of them. Bang as their own bullets. We may all be killed, but at least we'll take out a tiny number of them. 
<laughs> poor chaps may be making a mistake. Come give to poor chaps. Shall we go back then? No! The morning star has fallen! shall not destroy. It shall go or your empire of apes will never have the wit to find it. Let us charge these dogs, for our time has come to die. Come have a drink. 
think. <laughs> <laughs> this is more cheerful. At least now we are going, we are six men going, you'll ask one man what, what he means. I think it's a bit queer than that. I think it is six men going to ask one man what they mean. It's from Sunday. Now that you are uncovered, I suppose you want to know what I am. Bull, you are a man of science. Grub in the roots of those trees and find out the truth about them. Same, you are a poet. Go and stare at those morning clouds. Worms takes on forms. Inspector, your title gives you away. But I tell you this, that you will have found out the truth of the last tree and the topmost cloud before the truth about me. You will understand the sea, and I shall still be a riddle. You shall know what the stars are, and not know what I am. Since the beginning of the world, all men have hunted me like a wolf. Kings and sages, and poets and lawgivers, all the churches and all the philosophies. But I have never been caught, and the skies will fall in the time I turn to bay. I have given them a good run for their money, and I will now. There is one thing I will tell you about who I am. I am the man in the dark room who made you all policemen. What does the old lady have me? It ends with an address. Can it be the old devil's house? I already had a house in North London. Very well, we shall find him at home. We don't know Sunday at all. I do. It is because you are better than I, and do not know hell. The man who sits in darkness, who chose us all, chose me because I had all the crazy look of a conspirator, because my smile grew crooked, and my eyes were blue, even when I smiled. But there must have been something in me that answered to the nerves of all these anarchic men. For when I first met Sunday, he expressed to me not your airy vitality, but something both gross and sad in the nature of things. I found him smoking in a twilight room, the brown blind pulled down, infinitely more depressing than the genial darkness in which our master lives. He sat there on a bench, a huge heap of a man, dark and out of shape. He listened to my every word without speaking or even stirring. I poured out my most passionate appeals and my most eloquent questions. Then, after a long silence, thing began to shake, and I thought it was shaken by some secret malady. It shook like a loathsome and living jelly. It reminded me of everything I had ever read about the base bodies that are the origin of life. The deep sea lumps and protoplasm. It seemed like the final form of the most shaken and the most shameful. I could only tell myself from its shudderings that it was something. At least such a monster could be miserable. Then it broke upon me that the bestial mountain was shaking with a lonely laughter, and that laughter was at me. <coughs> Do you ask me to forgive him for that? It is no small thing to be laughed at by something both lower and stronger than oneself. Surely you are exaggerating wildly. President Sunday is a terrible fellow for one's intellect, but he is not such a barn of street physically as you make out. He receives. 
deceive me in an ordinary room. He checked coat in broad daylight. He talked to me in an ordinary way. But I'll tell you what is a trifle creepy about Sunday. His room is neat, his clothes are neat, everything seems in order. But he's absent-minded. Sometimes his great bright eyes go quite blind. And for hours he forgets that you're there. Now, absent-mindedness is just a bit too awful in a bad man. We think of a wicked man as vigilant. We can't think of a wicked man who is honestly and sincerely dreamy. Because we daren't think of a wicked man alone with himself. An absent-minded man means a good-natured man. It means a man who, if he happens to see you, will apologize. But how will you stand? An absent-minded man, who if he happens to see you, will kill you. That is what tries the nerves. Abstraction combined with cruelty. Men have felt it sometimes when they went through wild forests and felt that the animals there were at once innocent and piteous, that they may ignore or slay. like to spend ten mortal hours in a room with an absent-minded tiger. What do you think of Sunday, Gogol? Oh, I don't think of Sunday on principle, any more than you look at the sun at noonday. Well, that is a point of view. And what do you say, Professor? I think something I cannot say clearly. Or rather, I think something I cannot even think clearly. But it is something like this. My early life, as you know, was a little bit too large and too loose. When I saw Sunday's face, I thought it was too large. Everybody does. But I also thought it was too loose. The face was so big. One couldn't focus on it, or make it a face at all. The eye is so far away from the nerve that it wasn't an eye. The mouth is so much by itself that one had to think of it by itself. The whole thing's just too hard to explain. <coughs> Have you noticed something odd about all your descriptions? Each man of you finds something quite different. Yet each one of you can find only one thing to compare him to. The universe itself. Get on a little faster, son. When I first saw Sunday, I saw only his back. And when I saw his back, I knew he was the worst man in the world. His neck and shoulders were brutal, like those of some apish god. His head had a stoop that was hardly human, like the stoop of an ox. In fact, I had at once the revolting fancy that this was not a man at all, but a beast dressed in men's clothes. Go on. And then the queer thing happened. Then I saw him truly. His face frightened me, as it did all of us. But not because it was beastly or evil. On the contrary, it frightened me because it was so beautiful. Because it was so good. Are you ill? Listen to me. Shall I tell you the secret of the whole world? It is that we have only seen the back of the world. We see everything from behind, and it looks brutal. That is not a tree, but the back of a tree. That is not a cloud, but the back of a cloud. Cannot you see that everything is stooping and hiding a face? If we could only get round in front. Excuse me, gentlemen. There's a carriage waiting in the road just by. Who is your master? I was told you knew his name. Where is this carriage? It's only been waiting a few moments. Oh, what can it all mean? Is this another joke of Sunday's? I don't know. If it is, it's one of the jokes you talk about. It's a good-natured one. Your costumes have been prepared for you.